nomination for Stacy last, was it last weekend? Or I think that was soon. Anyway, so I thought it's a good topic to talk about again, is the difference between lay and priest. And um, so I'll just read it to start with. Questions of any kind, please ask anytime. Everyone knows what a loving mother's heart is. A mother cares for her young without thought for herself, offering love, nourishment, and protection until they can care for themselves. We think that these qualities belong to parents or parent-like figures. Bodhisattvas have these same qualities, and we all aspire in our practice to become like that. There's a saying in Zen Buddhism that we must develop a heart like an Obasan's heart. Obasan means grandmother, and it means someone whose activity is always nourishing and protecting others, without any thought of herself. Someone whose activity is warm, soft, and flexible. Another saying I like is that like a grandmother or a grandfather, an old person is like a country house in the winter snow on the roof, and a warm fire in the hearth. <laughs> it's always inspired me to embrace age as an asset rather than as a liability, as an expansion of the spirit rather than as a limitation. So I think that describes what we all try to be as a Buddhist in our practice. And Suzuki Roshi often made mention of a grandmother's heart, that we want our spirit to become soft and flexible like that. So whether we actualize it or not, we struggle constantly to open our hearts anyway to others. The difference between a parent's way and a bodhisattva way is that parents consider their own children as family and bodhisattvas consider everyone as family. To encourage us on the path, we can take lay ordination vows to emphasize our commitment to practice and lay life continues afterwards without any significant change to their lifestyle. Another way to state commitment is to take priest vows, and afterwards one's life is changed profoundly. After priest ordination, personal striving in the world no longer takes precedence in one's life. Priests may have their own children, they may have a life that seems not very different from lay life, but their perspectives and priorities are different. Priest practice includes everyone as their own practice, a difficult practice at best, and at worst, a constant reminder to us of how much we have to practice. In lay life, practice is just one of the many areas of their lives. They may even devote a lot of time to it. But in a priest's life, practice is first, and everything else follows as an expression of that. Their lives become simple, that is, just practice, practice, and practice. Lay life continues as practice, work, children, family, practice, and social life. But as a lay person continues to practice, their lives may become more like practice, work, practice, family, practice, social life. And if a lay life, if a, if a lay person continues practice, no matter what, it may also become simply practice, 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 and the same as priest lives, and then there's no difference between lay and priest. Lay people feel that caring for their children and families is natural and a labor of love. Priest vows include taking care of everyone like family, and that it's also natural and a labor of love. In a perfect world, everyone would always take care of each other as natural behavior. The trouble is we have to deal with self and it muddies the waters of our pure stream of practice because it's undisciplined and unmastered. Most of the time, we're not aware of this and believe that our problems come from others or from circumstances. We spend a lot of time trying to find ways to fix problems and finally to get rid of our difficulties. We don't study problems to learn from them. But when we turn our focus outward instead of on ourselves, we cultivate kindness, generosity, and tolerance instead of being lost in greed, hate, and delusion. 
A priest's life includes all of this. Like a loving parent who is constantly giving to their child, the way of priests is to open their lives to everyone and take care of them as if they were their only precious child, which is a quote from the Loving Kindness Sutra. Even before our hearts are big or strong enough, everyone is invited into the priest's life with the intention of spiritual nourishment for all. Everyone who follows the Bodhisattva path eventually will do this. Priest and lay alike, but a priest lets go of the world in order to invite in the world, even before they know what practice is. Their understanding becomes the activity itself and eventually the way to full spiritual maturity. Lay Buddhists strive in the world to express the way they see themselves with their ideas. Priests step back from the world even while entering the world and surrender their ideas about themselves to allow practice to transform them. Beyond their choice to become ordained, what they eventually become is not a personal choice, but comes from a conscious decision to let the path, not ideas, shape them as they practice. Priests make an aware decision to embody practice, even before they fully understand it. Taking priest vows is a way of saying to oneself, that it has become the first priority in one's life and everything else must follow. It has the unique result of making everyone and all things in one's life number one, except for one's own self. And one truly begins to study oneself when starting to think like that. Following the Buddha path doesn't narrow one's interest. It widens the mind and heart. Like a mother who loves her first child completely, and then has a second child. She doesn't love the first child less, she just loves more. The parent heart is like that. The more children there are, the bigger the heart. The Bodhisattva heart also extends beyond personal realm and includes everyone like that. And their hearts stretch with each one they let in. Person, priest, and lay alike do this in practice, even while struggling to master themselves. We all make mistakes, but nevertheless, as a result of the struggle, hearts open. We become able to love more of the world, not less. It just does not include self-love. So even as we expand our understanding of compassion, even as we make every effort not to cling to our own self, our self becomes more transparent, soft, flexible, kind, and generous. We stop interfering in our own activity. We stop muddying the water of our pure practice, and this is the power of practice. In form, priests wear robes and offer incense and encourage people to sit, chant, and bow, and sit together as a ritualized way to study the Bodhisattva path. For priests, Practice is first, and everything else is molded by it. One's life, one's very self, becomes an embodiment of practice, with ignorance, mistakes, joy, and sangha to fill in the rest. Lay life can be the same if practice itself becomes number one, and all else becomes an expression of it. This doesn't mean to become distant with our daily life, but to fully embrace it as our natural practice, giving each person, activity, pets, and things their full due respect and time, their full attention. For priests and lay people alike, this is a daily struggle to embody practice, whether in the zendo or out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. <laughs> yes, Joanne. Well, um, I was thinking uh, about a conversation I had last night with a friend of mine. Um, and uh, she, we were talking about um, intention and um, 
well, I think it was a lot about mindfulness. Uh, she was telling me about, uh, I, I told her about how I am doing this Marie Kondo cleaning of my house. You know, I don't know if you've heard of her, but uh, yeah, she, it's like a very intense, like um, purging and deciding what to keep. And, and then there's also a lot involved in how do you actually treat what you're keeping? Like, for example, she has a particular way of, you know, how you do your socks. And so, you know, you put it, you put them in a, in a particular way. And my friend was saying how she, uh, when she makes her bed now, she does it in a way so that she is not just making her bed, but she is making an excellent bed. And a bed where, um, where she wants to, you know, actually be there at night and you know feel the sheets and uh experience really good rest and um and so so you know when you were talking about um how your life becomes an expression of um you know like your heart or your bodhi buddha nature um that made me think about like, you know, why, why did I actually choose to do this <laughs> cleaning and, you know, roll my socks so that I see it on the spiral on the side and, you know, why is my friend like trying to make an excellent bed? And, uh, yeah, so I think, I think that's, um, maybe that's why, you know, and, um, so, you know, when we do the cooking, or the cleaning, um, when we do Oriyoki, we're, we're trying to bring that, um, that awareness, uh, and practice into, you know, what we're doing. So, um, so I realized that actually that's, you know, sort of a, a theme going on with my life where it, like, you know, it's not, this is home this is work, this is a Zen center, it's kind of like, well, it's all, you know, it's all one thing, and, it, and this is just a manifestation of how that practice uh, occurs at home, or at work, etc. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, I guess I, it, I'm just reflecting that all those little things, they, they matter so much. Yeah, I think um, uh, it doesn't really matter about priest or lay practice as long as practice becomes number one in your life mm -hmm. and the rest of it is an expression of that practice. Yeah. So if you care about everything, you care about your spouse, you care about your children, you care about your pets, your house, your car, whatever, then you begin to treat them with a different kind of respect as other than just something that <clears throat> you mix with and use. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, that sounds like the same thing. So uh, we're trying to move out of the Zendo into ordinary life, and it doesn't mean to just be mindful. Mindfulness <laughs> helps, but what it does mean is to give the moment its full respect, whatever happens to be in it, the Zendo in it, the room in it, the glass of water when you drink it. The sock. Just, yeah, the sock, whatever it is. So if you do it with the spiral on this side or that side, that's an individual decision. But the fact that you care enough to do something with it other than roll it up and throw it in the drawer, mm -hmm. I think is what she's trying to show. I think it's a good yeah. thing myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and like, I guess the way life normally works is we're just not conscious of how, even, even with Buddhist practice, like, you know, um, well, going to the Zen center, obviously that's, practice right but you know the fact that I have dirty dishes in the sink what does that <laughs> say about my that's, practice that's know? a that's a weak practice there right, exactly. I, I yeah. can um, <laughs> understand that one very well <laughs> yeah so it's but it is like taking care of everything it doesn't mean perfectly taking care of things but it means taking care as if you care giving your real caring to it mm -hmm. somebody last night in the practice in the uh, discussion group said that really it's just a question of coming into the present always so that you're not off somewhere else so mm -hmm. that you're giving your 100 percent attention to the people 
who are there or the things that are there mm -hmm. or the situation that's there. So I, I had a situation recently of the, uh, the water in the uh, laundry room overflowed. So the floor, when I stepped in there to put more laundry in, was like an inch thick in the, in the bottom. And I was in my sock, stocking feet. <laughs> And I stepped in and there was all this water in the bottom and I thought, oh no, because we were just going to go out shortly afterwards. So I threw a lot of things down there and when I came back I looked at it and they had all soaked up some of the water. But I, in my mind I was thinking, this should not happen, you know, <laughs> this, this is ridiculous and I don't want to have to deal with this now and all. So I still put it off and trying to air out the room somewhat. but. Still, when I look at it, I think maybe I should have like picked up the towels sooner, you know, and threw them in the washing machine or something. So, but it's like it's like precepts. You're always struggling with yourself as to what you're not doing that makes you feel uneasy. Mm -hmm. Like if it doesn't make you feel uneasy to throw your socks in the drawer, I don't think that it matters. But if it does make you uneasy, and I think if people stop long enough to look at themselves, they would find they are uneasy about things that just get brushed away. And so whenever we feel that uneasiness, we should stop and look at it and see what is it we're not doing right. I think that's kind of what happened because I realized, um, you know, things in my apartment had um, become, you know, like a source of, of uh, anxiety and a burden. And, I get um, that too. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, one of the philosophies about what she says with the cleaning is like, you handle things once ideally, and you make a decision about it. And, and you know, and like, that makes me think about, you know, the laundry room with the, the water, you know. <laughs> no. But, right, but um, what should I have done? What would have been better? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that sounds like it would be, um, a really good contribution to practice, you know, if you treat things like that. You know, yeah, you so in like, that sense, practice becomes your whole life. And mm -hmm. so in that sense, it becomes number one. And if it's you present. Can carry that everywhere mm -hmm. in your conversations with people, in your relationships with spouses, with children, with pets, or with anything, you know, if you can carry that same kind of openness to what's actually happening, then mm -hmm. I think that would make practice number one in anyone's life. I, there's a lot of priests, including me, that often have trouble making it number one. Mm -hmm. And there are many times that I wanted to go out and do something different. But I never wanted to be different. But I still kept thinking, well, wouldn't it be interesting to go do something this way or this way? And then I always come back, well, this is the way I actually feel right. So everybody struggles with something like that. So a layperson says, I want to be an artist, or I want to be a businessman or woman, or I want to be a... Uh, musician or something and then uh, uh, they go out and do it and a priest can do it but it limits a priesthood in a way that can be detrimental so the only way a priest could do it would be to do it as an extension of who they are as a priest mm -hmm. so uh, if their work is an expression of their practice in some way if it expresses how they practice or feel about practice then I think that's a, a natural extension of the practice. But if it becomes, I've got to do this because this was popular, this will make, you know, this will do something, then it becomes a real problem. So that's the, that's the uh, seduction of ordinary life. That's, sedu that's the seduction of self-life, is that it always looks interesting and enticing. But... Uh, Priest life takes a very stable stand and it doesn't change. And self life changes all the time. You either fail or succeed. You stay in the middle or you move around this way or that way. But as an expression of practice, I don't think it ever fails. Mm -hmm. I don't think it succeeds either, but I, I don't think it's like it matters at that point. It's like beyond either one. And it's just an expression of who you are as, as your practice. Well, I have so, another question, but I sure. don't want to hog the conversation. Anybody? Anybody? I haven't seen any. Oh, here. <laughs> so, if I was to do art, let's say as a priest or as extension of my 
practice? Does it mean that my art is limited by that? Or is it just, like, how, how would you say um, about the limitation? Like, of art. is there a limitation because yes, of my practice? Yes, there can be a limitation. For example, if I make paintings like this and I say, oh, I can't wait to put them on, you know, exhibition and do something with it, then uh, uh, I'm getting lost in self-world when that happens. And if I think, well, I want to make this and sell it, I want to do this and make some money, that's getting lost in self work. But if I'm just doing it because it's what I do, like incense and bowing, then it's an expression of me as a priest. If you just do it without gaining idea, if you just do it as a love of doing it, the joy of doing it, then I think it's different. So it really doesn't... Because I also noticed when art is created with the theme of religion of any sort, it has very similar tone to it and theme to it. It sounds kind of similar. And as a person who was receiving that art, I wasn't really fully resonating with that because to me, that expression was limited. To certain things um, what nourished me as a person who enjoy art was something that contains everything that I can relate to as an ordinary human being and I think that's what uh, moves people to that even if it's something that we normally don't want to express if it's expressed through art then it's more bearable and I think that's what helps people but in certain religions and whatever limitation they put on their art, to me that was just not fully nourishing to me. But I don't really get that sense from Buddhism in general, but I just wanted to ask you about like, so if I'm not pursuing any self-interest with my art and that means less people will get to see my art mm -hmm. and to me as an artist it's first the, the priority is to create from pure joy of creating but at the same time I also take it as my responsibility to spread it so that other people can enjoy it yeah I think um the, that's the question that gets into uh, self ideas because uh, I feel like whoever is present this is the whole world anyway and everything that comes through will appear okay. so um, I just think uh, the people who want to hear or see what you have to hear and show and, and uh, paint or whatever are the people that will see it. And uh, I don't mean to give the impression that famous artists can't be really good because there are many artists that I, I have been incredibly inspired, not just in painting, but in practice with their art. So uh, it doesn't, if, but if you're, if the world comes to that person and takes them into its you know world of, of uh, exhibitions and whatnot, that's fine, that's good. But if it doesn't come to you, I think I wouldn't trust it. That's how I feel about it. It doesn't mean you can't put your art out, but it means that if you, ex if you put all your energy into that, you're taking it from something important, which is like your practice, everyday practice. Right, I mean, to be honest, as an artist, I don't wanna do any of the promotion and getting it out there. I don't wanna do any of that. But I feel like it's my responsibility at this point because we have so many art out there. It's so, the market is extremely saturated. You can't really be found unless you put yourself out there. And if I don't do it, then people will never see it. And it's not really that I wanna get famous and I wanna make money from it. It's more for the benefit of other people who can enjoy it. Oh, I feel that way about painting too, about art too. But again, I think the ones who will see it and hear it are the ones who are looking for it. and they're the ones you want to talk to anyway. Right. So if it becomes on a wider scale, that's fine. But 
you know, if you go looking for it, it can dilute what you're doing. And I've seen it in my own work that if I ever got gaining into it, inevitably I couldn't paint in the same kind of joyfulness that I do because it would get very rigid. So when I just paint to do it because that's what I love to do and can do, then that's what I, that's the way I do it best. If it speaks to somebody, that's fine. But if it doesn't, that's okay too right. because whatever's here in this moment, this is it. This is the moment, the presence. And when you're playing music, that's the whole world listening to you. So I think our confusion is that we think we're at just another point in a thousand other, million other, incalculable other points of time. And we're not, we're right here. And we don't just practice folding, folding socks with a mind that's right here. We actually create with the same attitude and we exhibit with the same attitude, and we sing with the same attitude, that everything that's necessary is right here. It may open into a wide venue, like you might have a big venue of music. In that case, that's also what's there. It doesn't mean that everything has to be small to be genuine. It can be enormously big. In the Lotus Sutra, when the Buddha starts talking, he sees all of these, everyone there sees all of these uh, many worlds with all of the Buddhas sitting on the many lotuses and they were like unbelievably big numbers, like I want to say incalculable, but that's really hard to pronounce occasionally. But it's like, it's innumerable numbers. And so it's, the venue is that we limit our thinking and our senses and our minds for what's here and who's going to hear it and who's going to see it and who's going to be part of it. It doesn't matter. Suzuki Roshi, wasn't he the one that said, when he said, well, if nobody comes to your lecture, he said, well, if even one person is there, I'll give the lecture. <laughs> and, so, and I think he meant that as, if one person's there, all the universe is there. So it's our minds that limit us, and so we can't think of that. <laughs> so it's the expectation that limits us. It's, it's our closed mind that limits us. Our expectation comes from our closed feeling because we're trying to expand, but we can't. So our expectation is trying to open things. And that's how I see it. Expectation is trying to open things? Yes, we're, we want something, so we expect it to happen. And our expectation is like something we put out there. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting to do this or expecting to go somewhere. But you may not even do it. But, you know, it's kind of like your hopes you're putting out in the world. You're sending it out like a like a, uh, I can't think of an example, a little car or something, a little rolling thing. But it, it may not come true, but it doesn't matter because the expectation was uh, tied up with something unreal. You weren't in the moment when you're expecting in the future, is what I mean. But if you have even one person listening to you sing, you have everyone listening to you sing. And that's another thing Suzuki Roshi said, when you bow, the whole world bows with you. So I think it's our limitation that does not see the extent of the worlds we sit in. So if the Buddha sat and saw when everyone was sitting there with him, all his disciples and all the people that came, and they all just sat with him, but he opened up the world for them and they could see the world is a lot bigger than we think it is and, and the whole world is listening. All the world is listening and so when you sing, Sing to the whole world, not just to one person, even though you're singing to one person. That's how I think art is. That's my opinion, I have to say. It's not a Buddhist teaching. Yeah, excuse me one second. Mm. Uh, you talked about bringing practice into all the moments of our living. And for me, one of the uh, lenses of practice that I enjoy is the lens of gratitude. And if I'm in the moment and I'm practicing sitting and I'm, I have gratitude for the in-breath and for the out-breath, if I'm doing kin hen, I'll have gratitude for this step and the firm foot and the, have each moment is a moment of, to practice gratitude. If I'm making the bed, I think about that sheet, and then I can go to the 72 laborers has brought us this <laughs> sheet. <laughs> That's true. I, 
I mean, if I had to go out and make that sheet without all those laborers, <laughs> it, 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 would, it would not be a pretty picture. <laughs> yes. And so, uh, if I can infuse the, the element and the, the filter of gratitude, even over something I've spilled, well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? I don't know, like that made an interesting <laughs> shape. I hadn't thought of that. And I, said, sir, I wonder how that. patient I can be with it this time. And, I, and, and, I should show you my laundry room. And then I have a, a, a very dear friend who has gone through a lot of illness in the last year. And the ordinary things I find stand up for me I stand I stand up I'm grateful for this person to stand is a real effort and once they are able to stand are able to move more but it reminds me of how this simple act of I'm going to stand up is so complicated and so marvelous and I need to be grateful for what is allowing me to do it at, at that moment and uh, so that's an element of the, a practice that I find enriching for me. Me too, actually. I, I find uh, gratitude is, if when I get really low in spirits, gratitude is one of the ways you can pull yourself out of it because when you, uh, when you feel really low, you feel isolated and alone. And when you feel gratitude, you open up your world and say, this is, includes the whole world. Even my bad emotion is like, somehow related to this entire universe and then you feel gratitude come out and when you do your spirit opens up at least that's how i feel so whenever i feel really depressed or something i feel like oh that's i can't do this again and then uh then i think oh gratitude for the place that's here gratitude for the fact that people come and sit gratitude for the beautiful incense and the flowers and the people who care about all those things and gratitude for the kitchen, <laughs> you know, gratitude for Peter, <laughs> all the things that help us in practice. So yeah, for me, that's always like pulled me out of really low emotions. And I, I lived for a time in Guatemala and, uh, and uh, due to low economy, we only could turn on the hot water once a week to take a shower. So we would get, so that was, you know, okay, we could do one or two. But we had a neighbor, and he had a, a, a wife, and she was Guatemalan, and she had never taken a warm shower. <laughs> and so he invited her to come day, one day when we had the, the, the hot water tank heated, and she took in her, for her life her first warm shower. Now, normally here, if I jump in the shower, I, I just don't think about it. <laughs> but that experience of being without somehow infuses my gratitude for what we take as normal yeah. and every day. Yeah, well, that's what I mean by practice is, is first and everything follows because that, that sense is like really important, I think, that sense of gratitude to the whole universe. And, and uh, I don't, you probably all heard the kind of thing I heard like when I was a child, it's probably even up in this time. I complained because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Mm, yeah, and yeah. that inspired me to, you know, feel gratitude for things more than anything else. So, yeah, I, I think gratitude is like important, like maybe number one along with everything, like uh, generosity, kindness. But I think gratitude maybe is generosity, generosity to yourself, generosity to the world, that you're grateful that it's all there, I think. Don't understand it, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you mentioned in your talk, it kind of flew by me and I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on the concept of self-love. Um, it kind of came in right at the end and I was Oh, yeah. My mind was not in the present and was thinking about earlier parts of the talk. But um, maybe just to set up why I'm asking is um, just for myself, I think practicing Buddhism was a first and most important step to 
to finding a healthy relationship with self and like finding like ability to practice self-love but I'm still like figuring it out and trying to negotiate you know what are these you know as a lay person what is the um what is the what is practice teaching about our relationship to self and I've also found like I went for a time around down that like miss guided path of like is practice saying no self you know but that i found that it, for myself that has not been a productive framework so um coming into like honoring the self without attachment to ego is kind of where i'm at in terms of practice but it's such a murky and you know we could talk all day about it but maybe not no, it's actually a really good point. I think it's like one of the main points in here, actually. It says, we become able to love more of the world, not less. And that doesn't mean just your great spiritual being, but the self that interacts with everything. And then, uh, uh, we become able to love more of the world, not less. It just does not include self-love. That is uh, self uh, self. I think the words, it's the uh, translation here of self-love has two <coughs> meanings, one meaning to you and one meaning to me. Self-love, from my point of view, means to be uh, obsessed with oneself, mm. narcissistic, mm. that kind of self-love. Mm. Not, not the kind where you befriend yourself, where mm. you accept yourself and you like yourself as you are. That's a different kind. Maybe self-love is a bad choice of words. But the meaning I mean is to be wrapped up in yourself so much you can't see anything else except yourself. That's like narcissism sure. kind of thing. But just being good to yourself and being kind to yourself and taking care of yourself and accepting who you are, that's a different kind of self-love. That's mm -hmm. just a natural feeling of you know, embracing yourself, I think. I have to think of better words for that. Yeah. Self-importance? Self-importance maybe is uh, just, it can't be part of it. It can't, the self can't dominate our lives when it's undisciplined yeah. and unmastered. If, if we have no control over how we act and think and talk, then we're run by our emotions and we're run by our, our words and we're run by even our thoughts. Our thoughts can like destroy all kinds of things just by getting into negativity. Mm -hmm. But so it means to master our body, our speech, and our mind. So when we do that, yourself is like perfectly not only good but helpful. And so the self here, I said, becomes transparent, soft, flexible, kind, and generous. And that's what I think. If if you meet people in the practice, like our teachers were in Japan, they were exceedingly kind and soft. And Suzuki Roshi talked about that too. That we be kind become so soft in our whole being, like this grandmother's mind, you know, like an old person's mind who's matured and soft and, and not trying to gain anything, just trying to take care of someone. That's the kind of mind that we're working towards. I think it might be like, like you said, like a mistranslation or maybe the words are confusing to us. And that was what had confused me in the past that like obsession with self and narcissism and egotism and attachment to ego was equated with like acceptance and loving kindness toward oneself and like picking that apart i think since some of the texts can be confusing yeah. has been like quite a journey and yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's often actually compared to somebody riding a horse and the horse is the self and the person riding the horse is us who we are but our self is the words we use and the things we do and the thoughts we have all the time. But if they, we have no control over them, then we're just kind of nutty. You know, we don't have any way to work our way into things without getting lost and grasping. So it's, it, the meaning of self is like you train the horse. And then when you train the horse, the horse becomes an incredible ally. You can go anywhere on it. You can work any way with the horse when it's in discipline and mastery that's how i see mm. so uh, don't don't not embrace yourself ever don't let anyone tell you that there's no you should not care about yourself everyone should care about themselves because it's who they are it's how they relate to this world we live in and it's how we express mm. who
who we are as a bigger being. Small mind is what expresses big mind, I think, mm -hmm. through the two of them uniting or being together. Anyway, what were you going to say? Sorry. Well, I'm, I'm contemplating some of the things, uh, you know, about uh, the conversation on art. Um, so what I'm wondering is, um, like, let's say that, you know, you did these paintings and then they were put in a storage unit, you know, instead of being out here for us to see. Is that, is that sort of like practicing in by yourself in a cave? You know, Maybe because, not. because, well, like for example, Maybe there's no audience. Like, like, well, for example, like, um, uh, I like to sing. Let's say that the only singing I ever do or I ever intend to do is in the shower. And I do it in a way that expresses, uh, you know, my practice. But if nobody ever hear, if it like the tree falls in the forest, right? If uh, if nobody ever experiences um, how you know Buddha nature get it gets expressed through singing. I mean, mm -hmm. is that like practicing in a cave? Is is someone a bodhisattva if they practice in a cave, or does that have to be? Shared. Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean, but you're talking about outer sharing. Well, um, yeah, like, I mean, it, like, you know, we've talked about how um, Buddha nature um, expresses as Jane, and Jane um, expresses through art, and Buddha nature expresses as Joanne, and Buddha, Na and Buddha nature and Joanne expresses through such and such, right? Well, if I, if I never like interact with anybody, then, then it's just, does, is it, does it become like kind of self-serving? Huh? I don't could. know. I mean, it that's could. a bit personal. No, it could know? be. It could become self-serving. Because isn't like the role of the Bodhisattva, like not here, but like out there? The role of the Bodhisattva is to maintain the space you're in with integrity. That's how I would see it. Mm -hmm. If anybody sees a different role of uh, that, please speak up. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was just, Richard's your clock. <laughs> yeah, it was something that kind of like, you know, I was thinking about. But... Yeah. Okay, I, I, I uh, think that's a good question. But uh, do we have time for that? Well, we're kind of, I don't have, I don't have my watch today. But I think we've gone past 12, I guess. It's about 12.05. Yeah, okay. I'm kind of going back. That's going up to the... Okay. The the, um, if you want to talk about art sometime, please come over and talk about it. Mm -hmm. We had a very good discussion last night about art and Buddhism in the discussion group because uh, three or four of the people there were all acting active artists in one way or another. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a really good conversation. And... We had many discussions with our teachers in Japan about art and Buddhist practice. And uh, before that, you know, I used to feel like if somebody said to me, don't you feel you're taken away from your practice by painting? And I would apologize and say, yeah, well, maybe that's true. But now I think, no, that's not true. You know, as long as you make a meal, it expresses your Buddha nature. You bow with uh, the bell, you play the bells, you chant, that's expressing Buddha nature. So mm -hmm. your music is, your singing is one part of expressing Buddha nature. You express Buddha nature all the time, everywhere in whatever you're doing. So we're, we get into, uh, it has to be special to be Buddha nature, but actually a scowl can be Buddha nature. <laughs> you know, the simplest acts can be Buddha nature. So what we have to do is not... Uh, get attached to what we think is Buddha nature and not get attached to what we think is the right appreciation for what we're doing because we're limited in our, in our understanding about the world and we can't open it <coughs> with our limited thinking and so we're practicing to open everything and our Buddha nature is all part of that every bit of it whether we're painting or digging out in the garden it doesn't make any difference and one isn't more important than the other. One isn't more creative than the other. It's just different. 
We don't have to live with shoulds. With what? You don't have to live with shoulds. No. You don't have to say, shoulds. Yeah, we yeah. Should, I, I should, should do, do this. this. Yeah. I should be a Buddha, you know. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Hermits, hermits can be hermits. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if they really understand themselves, they will express their, their Buddha nature and somehow it'll get out. To, it'll, 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 it'll go beyond them. The a hermit may be in a cave, and that, and, and that yeah. hermit's power of meditation may actually, 1,000 people might live on that without, without knowing that they're living on it. Yeah. So you should, you know, you should be, only thing you should think about is, 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 Just doing is it. not being closed, but being open. So perhaps like expressing your Buddha nature as an artist or like, you know, singing in the shower. It um, sounds like enjoyable. Well, well, maybe, maybe that expression has something to do with like, uh, who you're being, you know, out in the world, like. Even if nobody ever hears me sing, maybe the expression of my Buddha nature, you know, when I go, like, if I say hello to somebody or smile at them on the street, maybe then that does have some impact on. Yeah, I, it's, what's that about the butterfly wing? Flaps is oh, swinging yes. in, <coughs> that, that, that theory and that, wind on the other side of the earth yeah, so you, everything mm -hmm. we do has repercussions, whether mm -hmm. you're in a cave doing it or not. Mm -hmm. So yeah. on the other hand, whether you are whether you are whether you are singing or you're washing under your armpits, it's the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so forget about forget about being a bodhisattva. Yes. Work on your life. That's all. Work on your life yeah. with 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 humility. And that would be true for singing of any kind or music of any kind. It would be the same. You know, just just do it because that's what you do. And that's, I think, what Suzuki Roshi meant by the wind bell. Be like the wind bell. It just when the wind when the wind blows, it just rings because that's what it does. Mm -hmm. When the Dharma is present, you sing. You sing in the shower. I paint. You know, everybody has their own. You know, whatever it is, just do it because there it is to do, and you can do it. Yeah, it's like if we attach thought to our action, it's actually pretty paralyzing at yeah. least to me yeah and i think a lot of people think that we have to put intention to our action but sure to a certain degree but when you're actually doing it you just gotta do it yeah. without thinking about oh i'm <laughs> gonna express my buddha nature and, and yeah, it's no, not no, gonna no. work when, whenever you feel that way just say i'm grateful i have a voice i'm grateful i have a throat you know <laughs> i'm grateful i can make a sound <laughs> i'm because grateful i can hear it <laughs> you know just say your gratitude for everything Okay, thank you for your questions.